Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series, which are held in room 303 on the third floor of the City County Building on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule of this series, as well as information about Historical Society activities and programs, can be found on our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television and on our YouTube website. Our speaker today is archaeologist Nolan Johnson. Nolan is a, graduate, is a native of South Dakota and a graduate of the University of South Dakota Vermilion. For the past eight years, he has worked for the Nebraska State Historical Society and now serves as highway archaeologist. The title of his presentation today is Archaeology Q&A Question and Answer, and he will discuss archaeology in Nebraska and answer questions from the audience. Nolan. Thank you, Tom, uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, as Tom said, we're going to try to talk about anything anybody wants to talk about, about Nebraska archaeology. We, Tom and I sort of came up with this a couple months ago after we did uh, Nebraska Archaeology Month in September, and we had a good response to that, so we figured that people would want to know more about archaeology of the state because there is a lot a lot of archaeology that goes on in Nebraska that maybe people aren't aware of. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, we posted on Facebook and we did actually got one response about a question somebody wanted to know about, um, more about the mill, this flour mill we use for a photo of the flyer. And here is a map from 1913 about Catron's Mill. Uh, you can see the mill building is right here. Here's the dam and here's the pond. And uh, this mill is northwest of Nebraska City a little bit. And uh, this is from 1913, but the mill itself probably dates from the 1850s. Uh, so it's one of the, one of the very first mills in, um, in Nebraska. And we got involved, uh, mainly my boss, Rob Bozell, uh, because this county, there's a bridge right here. We see it says bridge, still a bridge there today. Maybe the one from 1913, it's in pretty rough shape the bridge that's there, but the county needs to replace it. And as part of our highway archaeology job, um, we had to evaluate what the remains of this mill, which is pretty close, and part of it is under the road, and uh, it might be impacted when they replace the bridge. And here's what's kind of the biggest feature today, and this is, um, we're looking south, and there's this big wall uh, that overhangs the creek, Walnut Creek there. And we're concerned that if they start driving big metal piles into the creek bed to build a new bridge, this whole thing is just going to go splat into the creek, and that's not good for anyone. But um, it's pretty interesting. You can see some of these that look, you know, you can, there's a vertical wall here, and then another one over here that sticks um, out a little bit farther. So you can see there was, um, there were walls running north-south that extended. It would have, the creek is eight away. We're not quite sure how much it's eight away. We're pretty sure a lot of the mill is still south of this, is still intact, but the creek is actively eroding it away. And here's a picture um, taken after the mill was shut down in the late 1920s. The mill probably ran till the early 1920s. But this is sort of the same view looking to the south. And you can see that the bank is quite a, is a, some distance from that stone that's all that stone foundation. So we're, the, the picture before, we're looking at what's left of that stone foundation and all the superstructure um, either was pushed in and burned or carted away. We're not quite sure. And we might do more work out there to kind of find out what's left, but that's all up for debate. So that's our lone internet question. So now, um, if anyone has questions, I'll, we'll talk about whatever anybody wants to talk about today. So I'll turn it over to the audience. You, sir. I just want to ask you a question following up on this thing. Sure. I understand the concept of preserving something. 
Mm -hmm. But you showed the, you've got the picture. Yeah. You showed the prior thing. Mm -hmm. I don't have any idea how that fits into whatever else is there or if that's it. But the thought occurs to me, um, what's there to say? Sure, sure. That's a good question. We get that question a lot of, you know, why do we do what we do? Um, this, this map will sort of help. The, the red are features that are still there today, um, stonework and some earthwork features that are still preserved today. And uh, we're, what's interesting about this mill is, you know, if it's just a ruined building and maybe there's not much left, yeah, then we probably wouldn't, we might not care as much. But in this case, you know, we have that big wall and you can see the mill foundation, um, that's that big red line right here. And then the creek is now right here, but we're pretty sure that the rest of the building is still intact. And we know from historical documents <coughs> that a lot of these mills had real substantial um, substructures to, because they, uh, early flour mills use big belt powered things. And to run the belts, you need a big basement so the belt can go all the way down and come back up. And then you have different levels of sifting and sorting and refining all the flour. So there would have been a lot going on in the basement. And later, we know that this mill in particular, they converted from regular water power to steam power. So if you have, um, you would have had a big steam boiler and, and you know, a lot of piping and how that, sort of how that piping related to how you get the water in and how you discharge the water. And you can see there's this thing that says culvert here is a big cut limestone arch culvert that goes under the current county road that was probably the dam at some point to bring water to the mill. And, you know, I've seen a lot of mill sites that where there's nothing left. And so to have one, especially from the 1850s, that has these substantial stone features, and you don't see a lot of, this, I mean, this is really early architecture in Nebraska, these um, sort of rough, rough fit limestone foundations and stuff. So it, it's pretty unique and it's pretty interesting. And there's some more features, like there's part of the dam spillway we think is still there. Um, and there's another, there's part of probably a stone um, abutment for part of the dam at some point that's still preserved. And there's a, there's, I mean, there's something, there's a lot to be learned and this just depends on what questions you want to ask. So, um, so I hope that answers your question. And, and okay, next. Yes, ma'am. Several months ago, you did some uh, digging on Highway 136 east of Franklin. You bet, yes. Um, that's my area. Can you tell me? Why and what you were looking for or what you found? Yeah, um, the young lady wants to know why we were out east of Franklin on Highway 136 <coughs> digging some holes. And um, that was probably me and uh, one of my colleagues were out there. Um, and um, in that case, there was a highway improvement project. And I can tell you that the Republican River Valley, especially on either side of Franklin, is rife with sites. You can't, any flat piece of ground um, it's probably got archaeology on it. So we were out there because in one of these locations, the roads department needed to um, do some culvert work and extend culverts to make, um, they call it clear line of sight, and they need to have the culvert ends farther away from the road <coughs> because cars are bigger and faster, so things need to be farther away. So we were out there looking to see if there was any archaeological features close up to the road. <coughs> And in that case, there, there wasn't at that site. But I can tell you that there's one site down, basically, on the next drainage um, in the 70s, when they first cut that highway, they excavated earth lodges right out of the road cut, literally out of the road cut. And I looked at that site, and I, I would bet fairly certainly that there's more lodges and more things. And uh, we looked, and there's all sorts of artifacts and real kind of finished artifacts, what you usually find at a habitation site, right up, right up to the road, in the right-of-way even. And in, in a lot of, in especially cases like that, where um, that highway, 136, and some other highways in the state, they run through a lot of hills. And when they go, you know, they cut these hills down, and they make these big cuts. 
and then the right of way always extends back on top of the that still the flat part. So a lot of times there's archaeology still up on that flat spot, but it's in the right of way. So you know that's owned by the state, so it's our responsibility to 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 um, at least consider those archaeological resources, even though they're already, especially because they're already owned by the state. So it's a, that's why we were out there that time. Yeah. In that, for that project, we're not because um, the roads projects is uh, they do a lot of these resurfacing and kind of minor safety improvements, so they're not moving a whole that much more dirt. So um, we tested the one spot where they were kind of moving more dirt, and uh, decided there was nothing important. There was nothing to be preserved. There was nothing to worry about in that case. We we two, I guess 2012. On the west side of Franklin, there was another site, same deal, road cuts through a big hill. They want to move the, the cut back so you can have a nice slope. And we, we investigated there because, again, there was a site on the flat spot, and uh, the, guy, the farmer's field is just littered with uh, chipstone debris, kind of the remains of making stone tools. And we talked to the landowner, you know, and he farmed it for years, and he's like, I just thought these were rocks, you know, because it's just this carpet of them. But, in that case, that site had been uh, pretty well eroded, and there, there weren't any features or kind of, there was nothing intact. It had all been moved around and mucked up by 100 years of um, kind of mechanized agriculture. So again, we tested it, and at the end of the day, we recommended to the roads department, you know, go ahead and cut this away. There's nothing significant you're going to disturb. And um, I will say, you know, the Department of Roads, they. We've been working with them since the 50s. They've really been a pioneer in um, preserving archaeological resources. They do a really good job, and usually, usually they, they listen to what we have to say, and uh, we do a lot of avoidance of these resources so that they can be preserved for future research questions or, or future technology or, you know, just for, you know, the next generation of archaeologists to, to, to have to use if they need to. Yeah. Any, yeah, in the purple. Yeah. What is the next step when artifacts, items are uh, discovered? What happens to them? Uh, she wants to know what's the next step when artifacts are uh, discovered. And we'll skip ahead. I got to a nice picture of a site I worked on so we can have some context. Here's a good one. Uh, I did this site. This site is, um, I don't know if any, how familiar everyone is with Lincoln, but out by the Abbott Sports Complex, they built a, a race, a motorcycle race track. And when they were bulldozing kind of the ramps, um, the people working there from the NRD noticed all these bones around. And so they called me, and I uh, went out there and uh, did an investigation for them. But, you know, at that site, um, all, you can see, here's one of the tests I dug at this site, and you can see, you know, here's a bone, here's a bone, here's a bone, here's a bone, here's a bone. Uh, this is this carpet of bison bones, and unfortunately, uh, through nobody's fault, um, we only discovered this after they had bulldozed all this stuff up, so everything was all smushed up and beat up and, you know, pretty well. Here's some of the bigger ones. There's a vertebrae and a mandible fragment. And you got a pen, and the, those are centimeters for scale. but so I did, col I did collect, to get back to your question, I did collect some of these, and uh, the, the people who found them originally, you know, the, the NRD, um, there was a woman there who, who had had archaeological training, so she recognized that, hey, this is something we need a professional to come investigate. So they contacted me, and then I did a little investigation, see what's out there, see what's left, see how bad it's messed up. And then I made a recommendation um, to the federal agency involved and said, you know, uh, this looks like a temporary hunting camp. Um, it's really beat up from the bulldozers, and even if it wasn't, there might not have been that much there anyway. And then at the end of the day, again, they go on with their, their racetrack. But the artifacts I collected, um, the NRD owns that land, so, um, you know, I gave them to them and they, I, I assume they're still sitting at their, their building somewhere because they own, in the United States, um, stuff on private property is property of the landowner unless it's uh, 
falls under a couple of laws that deal with graves and grave goods and um, uh, really culturally sensitive things, maybe like medicine bundles or items of cultural patrimony that are important to entire native groups or, or deal with graves. But otherwise, you know, stuff just bones like this, the landowner, you know, can pretty much do what they want. And uh, again, everyone did what they were supposed to do, but unfortunately, you know, you, you run a bulldozer ever, over everything. Uh, there's not much left, and you can see this map I drew. Uh, this is the racetrack, this line right here. And all these dots are where I found bones, and you can sort of see that, you know, all the bones are in areas where they piled up the dirt. You know, I found a lot of bones up on top of these ramps. You know, clearly they've been moved, and they were broken and stuff. So there wasn't a whole lot uh, left intact in that in that case. But uh, for anyone, <clears throat> if you think you have an archaeological site on your property, um, you can always call the State Historical Society. And at the very least, um, we'll record it and report it. So then if there is ever any um, work done, at least we'll know about it ahead of time. And we always encourage people just to leave everything in place um, because, you know, there's, a, there's a, a very systematic scientific way if we're going to excavate a site um, to go about things. We're not, we don't just go pick up stuff and say, oh, look, this is neat. Uh, I mean, we do that sometimes, but that's not, what, that's not, that's not the idea. Um, you know, there's a, there's a rhyme and a reason, and, you know, it's better to leave stuff in place um, for, for future use if you can. Um, if things are going to be destroyed, you know, then that's when usually when we get involved, especially for roads projects. If roads are going to destroy things, then we, we mitigate it by excavating it, and then we collect all the artifacts and, you know, <coughs> catalog everything and write some reports so that information is preserved as best we can. So, okay. Yeah. I just wondering, like, because I wasn't here in September what, if you were here then. Or, you know, we didn't what, do a brown are, bag, but yeah, we had talks oh, or all over the state, sure. So what are some of the some of the most significant or fascinating things that you found just maybe in your, uh, in that's, your job? I got some pictures. That's, that's, he wants <laughs> that's to know. Like there you go. He, yeah. uh, the gentleman wants to <laughs> what's some interesting things that I that I found, and uh, we can look at some some of the uh, couple sites. Here's a good picture of, you know, archaeology is not all fun games. There's me getting a truck stuck. <laughs> and uh, here's a big excavation after it rains three or four inches. It's kind of messy. And the guy laying down is me. So, you know, it's hard sometimes. It's hard work. But um, some of the most interesting things we found, um, where's my favorite picture? Here, I like this guy. Uh, this is a site called the Duck Creek site. Um, it's down by Peru, Nebraska, which is between Nebraska City and Auburn. Uh, we got the Historical Society was involved because the, um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service and the NRD are going to build a dam um, on, on Duck Creek, and uh, there's an archaeological site that the dam is going to be pretty much on top of. But uh, at the site, we found this guy. We call him Friendly Face Man. And, uh, that's basically a pot hand, like a, uh, the handle of a pot, and on the pot he would have been looking up at you, and I assume there would have been at least two on either side of the pot. But, you know, I'd never found a human effigy ceramic like this before, so that was really interesting. And that whole site was pretty interesting because when we think about kind of these ceramic makers from maybe a thousand years ago or maybe a little bit older, we usually talk about square or round earth lodges, uh, you know, four center posts, fireplace in the middle. It's kind of a, a systematic view of how things are supposed to look. But this site, nothing looked like that. Everything was, there was two fireplaces right next to each other. And, you know, if we drew our, our uh, let me get back to a different map. Well, here, we'll, we'll change gears. Um, the same site, we found all these rim shirts. And you, uh, here's a picture of just one that goes straight up and down. And there's one with all this crazy, you know, line decoration. And here's another one that's got a big, thick collar on it um, that's called a collared rim shirt. And you find a lot of those uh, more in western Nebraska. It was sort of unusual to be right along the Missouri River. You know, there's just some more that no two pots at this site looked the same. It was just, there was something going on where, 
uh, the people there were either trading or, you know, there's a lot of different groups, and we can't say for sure that all the stuff came from the same time, so maybe it was just a different groups over time. But for whatever reason, there was a lot of influences on how they decorated their ceramics at this one site, and the house construction didn't look like, like what we expected either. Um, we think maybe it was kind of a temporary camp, so they didn't build the classic big, fat, sturdy earth lodges for overwinter. So that was pretty interesting. Um, I've also found, I worked at a, a trails-related site. We can jump ahead too quick. Here's a picture of it. There's, I did my thesis on this site, and uh, we're pretty sure we excavated this building, which is one of the interesting things about historic archaeology is um, a lot of times people will ask, you know, if there's written records, why, why do you need, you know, if people think all farmstead, ruined farmsteads are, you know, like this is a, a road ranch, it's not really a farmstead, but, you know, it's a little bit different. People will ask, well, what do you care? We can just, I can just go read a book about, you know, what people were doing in the 1860s. Um, and that's true, but, you know, not a lot of people write books about everyday life in Nebraska, about the ins and outs of, you know, horse trading at this road ranch on the farm or on the, the Oregon Trail or, you know, why they built their house, how they built their house, you know, what they were, you know, what they were eating. You know, a lot of people don't write about the bad times either. They sugarcoat everything. Um, and, you know, women are underrepresented and children and, you know, some minority groups. You know, we know a lot about uh, my favorite, we know a lot about uh, military expeditions, we know a lot about what the general was thinking and the people in command were thinking, but we don't know a lot about, you know, what Joe Smo private, how they spent their day necessarily. Um, and archaeology can get to those questions because um, everybody throws away trash and, you know, you're not selective about it. You're not thinking, well, if I throw this away, what are people going to think? Whereas when you write your memoirs, that's exactly what you do is you think about, well, you know, People don't need to know I ran away from this battlefield. We'll say it was a strategic retreat and stuff like that. So, but this side was pretty interesting. And we can look at some artifacts from here quick to see what, what kind of stuff. Um, here's some glass fragments, which are pretty interesting. Um, some of them are melted, and you can see there's lots of different bottles kind of represented. And uh, it's, you can tell a lot about um, the beverages people were drinking, even from just little tiny fragments like this. Like this little one, we found some more pieces with this kind of decoration. And that's probably from something called Kelly's Old Log Cabin Bitters. And bitters were uh, a way for people to drink alcohol and pretend they weren't drinking alcohol. It was medicinal medicine which was alcohol and sometimes laudanum mixed in even, or tobacco, just really nasty stuff. But Kelly's old cabin log bitters came in a square bottle shaped like a log cabin, and it was a brand name. And um, it came in this dark olive green glass with the, the roll. Those are logs. So that's pretty interesting that you can get to that. Again, with historic archaeology, we can get to that level of detail, which is pretty interesting. And again, uh, the buttons at the site, you can tell a lot about the, the kind of the social position of people at the site. The top right one is a hand, that's a handmade shell button. And um, you were probably pretty low on the social economic ladder if you were, had to make your own buttons out. That's probably some kind of uh, uh, a bone that somebody just had and they needed a button, so they made it themselves. The one on the bottom is a fancier, it's called a Prosser button. It's a ceramic button, and you can see it's got a blue star pattern. And the, the right, it's a rifle regiment button there with the R. Um, so somebody probably, you know, this road ranch was uh, in operation post-Civil War. A lot of Civil War soldiers came out to make good on their land grants, passed through here. Somebody lost the button. The little clover is uh, a button from a, a, a Finian's organization, which in the 1800s, um, there are lots of Irish and pro-Irish organizations in the United States um, that advocated invading Canada to force England to trade Canada for Ireland. 
it, they never really did anything, but um, there were, I can't remember the name, but there was in Lincoln, um, when a gentleman died, uh, they found hundreds of rifles he had stockpiled for a potential invasion into Canada. So there were people in Nebraska who had this idea that this is how we're going to free Ireland from, from England was, was to take the domains of Canada. And the, you know, these, all these buttons were found at this one road ranch, so you can, ju you can just think about the, the diversity of folks that came through there, or, or you know, somebody might, some people were living there too. And uh, one, more, one more artifact from there. The bottom right um, is part of a, a ceramic dish and a, the diamond with the gobble of letters and numbers is called a registry mark. And uh, that's an English patent. And um, we can tell, I never, I'm pretty sure it's the, that date, all those numbers mean something. You can look that up online real easy. And so we know that that pattern on the other side of that dish was patented, if I remember, it's December, I think today, maybe, it might be December 18th, 1858. So we know the exact day, we can tell you to the exact date that that bowl can't be any, it physically can't be any older than, which means that if you find that at your site, you know that that site is post, post dates that date on that, that registry mark, which is, that's really interesting. And then the, the other diamond is an importer's mark from a company in St. Louis, and um, we know a lot of uh, goods that came out on the plains were imported by kind of middlemen warehouse guys in St. Louis, shipped to St. Louis on steamboats, and then maybe shipped farther up to Omaha and then carted west on big freight wagons. And some of those would have passed through this road ranch, and the people at the road ranch um, would have, would have been able to purchase goods or had brought goods with them to use out there on the plains. So those are kind of two of the uh, more big, um, you know, data recovery excavations I've been involved with. Um, but uh, while we're on this, if, if, if nobody else has a question right now, um, a question I get a lot is, how do you know where stuff is? People always want to know, how do you know where to dig? What do you, you just wander around poking in the dirt? And well, yes, but it's a, we do have ideas about where things are. Um, let me get to one of these fancy uh, geophysical map. There's, I like this. Where's this? Here's a good one. This is a, it's your magnetometer gradient data, which we use a machine that measures the differences in the magnetic fields in the soil. And um, human occupation messes those up, and you can see the differences in the soil. Now, the real heavy paired red and blue blobs, those are metal artifacts, um, not necessarily. And this is taken from that trail site, so this is the 1860s. Um, so a lot of metal artifacts, but it was also a farmer's pasture, so that might be a fence staple or his pliers he lost last week. We don't know. But what we do know, what's interesting, what's more interesting, as you can see, these you know these hor these red horizontal lines, and um, this ridge here, you can follow this ridge. Um, this is the floodplain. This is the higher terrace, and you can see there's um, one, two, three, four. There's about five or maybe even six down here of these lines that all kind of go and then sort of converge farther to the west. <clears throat> and what that tells us, and you can still see that. Now, this is a picture of the same one, same spot, and you can see um, the, the white is the grass is seeded, and the darker green is where it hasn't. And where it hasn't are the trail ruts coming up from that floodplain. And because the trail compacted the ground so much, um, the grass is stunted, basically. It can't hold as much water, and it can't thrive as much. So you can still see there's one, two, three, four, and there's a little one right here, five trails that all come out of there. And in this case, we can see that, you know, just with, our, with the naked eye, but you can also see that how, you know, something as innocuous as just driving your, you know, hundreds and thousands of wagons over the dirt, you know, leaves a signature that 150 years later is still, you know, still readily visible to us. And so then we know that, you know, these road ranches, you're going to be next to the trail, and that's how we know sometimes where to, where to dig in that, look, that situation. We can find where to go. Um, and there's another, and here's some more 
data from that site, and um, you can see uh, this circle. You can see it here. This is a conductivity, which means we're measuring how well electricity passes through the soil. And again, um, this works really well on historic sites where you have maybe foundations which stop the electricity dead, so you can really see walls and foundations and stuff. But the circle is a well, and you can see that, and then that's magnetometer again, and you can see you can see the circle. And then again, this is the trail, part of the trail we got. You can see it's the electrical conductivity is way different in the trail than the rest of the site. But if you use your imagination, you can see one, two, three. This one's kind of mucked up, but four. And those are the corners of the building we excavated. And you can see over, you can almost see that the outline of a square in red over on the magnetometer. And in that, at this site, you really couldn't see anything on the surface. It was overgrown and seeded, you know, bromus, grass. But we knew it was out there because the landowner um, had talked about how he could remember kind of a sod hump, and he thought maybe it was a sod house or something that had collapsed. And so this really helped us guide our excavation, saved us a lot of time, so, and we could, we could take this data and just put excavation squares right over top of it, and that's helpful um, on how to know where to dig. And other times we don't have access to this um, geophysical data, and then you, you might uh, look at um, concentrations of artifacts, you know, something as simple as where artifacts are most densely concentrated, that might be where you want to dig, because you, you can be pretty certain that that's where more things were going on in the past. And um, another question we often get um, is people always want to know um, what tribe their artifacts belong to or what tribe was at this site or, you know, who is, who is here, who is doing this? And the answer to that is, you know, we don't know a lot of times. Um, we know um, a lot of the tribes, historic tribes that were in Nebraska, you know, Pawnee were in the middle part of the state. Um, the Oto and the Omaha, the Iowa, the Missouri, the, you know, the Ponca, all along the Missouri River. But those, besides the Pawnee, all of those are recent uh, immigrants, um, the 1700s, or maybe the 1600s at the very, very, very earliest. Anything older than that, it gets kind of sketchy because um, people move around so much and you're left trying to um, match up um, artifact technologies, ceramic decorations, you know, type of projectile points, um, what people ate, just all this different data, and you're trying to match that to historic groups. And just because the people were in the area, you know, in the 1800s, they, you know, their, even their cultural histories, their, their oral histories will tell us that they came from, like, you know, the Oto, the Missouri, the Win you know, the Winnebago, the Omaha, Ponca, those are all Great Lakes tribes originally that, you know, as European settlement on the East Coast just created a wave of everybody had to move west. Everybody kept getting pushing west. And um, the Sioux, all the Lakota groups originally were from, you know, parts of Minnesota. And then when they, you know, came in contact with hor the horse and the gun, then they became kind of the nomadic bus bison hunters that we see it. In you know John Wayne, every movie John Wayne's in, the sewer, you know, it's always the sewer coming, always the sewer coming. And that happened, but that was a real narrow time frame of when those groups, you know, adopted that lifestyle. And so, you know, at most sites in Nebraska are a thousand years old, or, or a lot of sites are older. We really have no idea. We can't place that with any known group. And so it's just all we know is we have names for all these groups of people based on how they lived and you know, what they did and, you know, how they decorated their pots and stuff, but we can't correlate that to, uh, to, to known tribes. <clears throat> yes, sir. I'm from Rivalo County. Okay. <clears throat> and something I've not thought about for years now, but I'm going to say about 15 or 20 years ago, there was information, I believe, from the State Historical Society about uh, a grave site that was found south of the town of Indianola on the Republican, south side of the Republican River. Mm -hmm. And 
if my, as I recall, they thought that grave site was uh, thousands of years old, and it had artifacts in it, some from the Pacific Northwest, some from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I called over and talked to somebody, I think it was at the Historical Society, it's been long, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any story about that site? Uh. He wants to know about, he's asking about a specific uh, burial site um, south of Indianola, which is in the Republican River Valley. And, um, you know, not off the top of my head, but I can tell you that, you know, even, um, yeah, th graves thousands of years ago, we know uh, people had access to exotic goods. Like you said, um, they were trading yes. for shells from the Gulf, both the Gulf Coast and the Pacific Coast. Um, we'll also find obsidian artifacts from Wyoming and Idaho, or um, copper artifacts, uh, usually from the Great Lakes. And so, you know, even, uh, you know, five, 6,000 years ago, people who we think about being very nomadic, you know, not really highly organized, um, we don't think those people who lived in Nebraska were walking down, you know, they're not saying, let's take this, this is the summer we all walk to the Gulf Coast and collect a bunch of shells and then we walk back. Um, they knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy, you know, and the people in Nebraska in that time were, you know, might have been trading um, bison robes or even, you know, dry bison meat or bison bones to use as tool, or um, there are places in Nebraska, the Nahaka chert quarries would have real high quality lithic material, they might have been trading that to places that didn't have access to that high quality stone and that, you know, they're trading it for exotic goods that they would never have access to anyway. And you're right, we find a lot of that in, uh, in grave sites because um, whatever the cultural situation was, that that was kind of, they were burying things that were important, probably not only to that person, but were important to that tribe. You know, you're not going to have a whole lot of um, Texas Marine Coast shells, you know, in a band of 100 or, you know, 50 people you know, clearly that, that held a lot of significance and it was important to send that along with that person when they passed away and that's, we find a lot, that's how we find a lot of that exotic material, especially um, from that long ago and to, for specifically for your side, you know, if you could pull out of your memory a section number, you know, the section it was in or even south, on the south side of the river near Indianola, you know, we have a list of all the sites that have been reported and we can look up um, what was found there and, you know, what age the stuff was, so I could probably figure it out. I was, I, I was just sitting here thinking about when, when that site was located. They, they were doing a road cut mm -hmm. and actually a childhood friend of mine was wandering along the road cut and he's the one that discovered this. And uh, that, that's what the guy from wherever I called told me, and I, you know, don't remember the guy. So I'm saying that I, they probably found this site. It had to be 50, 60 years ago, because this guy's about my age. Mm -hmm. and, and he, the fellow I talked to, said they were going to do some further investigation and exploration. He talked about what you just said about the trade routes. Mm -hmm and all of that, and I don't know whether anything ever came of it, but I, I have a book at home that has a little sidebar picture in it, or item in it about this, and I'm going to look at that when I yeah, get you can, <laughs> you can certainly call us up and we can check it out, and we'll probably be able, we should be able to narrow it down if we're talking an archaic age grave site. We can probably figure out which one you're referencing. Yep. Sure, and we, you know, we'd be happy to do that. Um, and we'll, I'll just say something, you know, we were talking about burials and um, we talked about private, private property and private ownership, but, and uh, I mentioned briefly, but burials, whether they're Native American or, or Euro-American, are protected under several different laws and it's, it's a crime to mess with a burial at any time. It doesn't matter if it's on private property or not, it doesn't matter if it's you know, 50 years old or 10,000 years old. Um, there's NAGPRA, which is a national law to protect Native American graves and grave goods. And um, Nebraska has a state burial law um, that deals with the same sort of stuff. Um, 
So if you ever come across what you, anybody thinks is are, are human remains, you know, immediately call probably the county sheriff or the closest law enforcement agency, and they'll investigate. And if they feel it's not an active crime scene, then they call us, and then we get involved. And <clears throat> usually we try to figure out, you know, at a minimum how old this is, um, especially so we'll know um, where to rebury the stuff. That's the ultimate goal. We don't want to keep the bodies of people out of the ground indefinitely. That's not what we're after. Um, if we can tell it's a Euro-American, we'll look for, if possible, we'll try to find descendants and see what they want to do, or if there's no descendants, um, it goes to the county attorney, and they, they have a, a spot to rebury in one of the cemeteries in the county. And if it's a Native American group, we try to determine what tribe it might have belonged to, but as I said before, that's pretty hit and miss. And if it's unaffiliated um, in Nebraska, there's a Nebraska Indian Commission that has an agreement that they will take all the unaffiliated remains and rebury on them in a, in a ceremony that um, the resident tribes of Nebraska today have all agreed that that's okay. And so ultimately, we try to learn what we can in a reasonable amount of time, but then we, we like to get this stuff back in the ground just as a way to be sensitive to, to everyone's beliefs. So, um, you know, another, <clears throat> excuse me, another question we get is um, just generally, people don't think, uh, people always ask, well, what's archaeology in Nebraska? There's no, you know, there's no pyramids, there's no Stonehenge, there's no, there's nothing going on in Nebraska, you know, and that's not true. Nebraska has a, uh, an archaeological record that's at least 12,000 years old, and there's some some sites that you know might be pre-Clovis or you know might be 18, 20,000 years old, and there's um, there's no stone you know monumental arch architecture in Nebraska, but there are um, you know big uh, Native American village sites where hundreds or maybe even thousands of Native Americans in the late pre-contact time or living in one place, which, you know, these kind of places offer just a wealth of archaeological information about how these tribes were living. And, um, you know, I've looked at old maps and dissertations from the 19-teens, and, you know, the guys writing these things talk about, you know, under what is Omaha today, there were hundreds and hundreds of these earth, lo earth lodges, you know, habitation sites that people just knocked out, you know, dug up, people were digging up to look for bodies and collecting skulls as, you know, it's kind of the antiquarian movement of the early 1900s, but, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of these things just under Omaha because it's such a, along the Missouri River, it was a heavily populated area, and there are, there is lots of archaeology in Nebraska, you know, and we don't have kind of the big megalithic structures that excite people or, you know, that are in movies, you know, Indiana Jones is in, in Nebraska digging up, you know, up a Republican Earth Lodge, but they're interesting and there they are stuff to tell us about how people lived in the past and that's ultimately what we're after is we want to know, you know, how people made a living in Nebraska in the past and, you know, what interests me, um, we talked about trail sites before, um, you know, the Platte River has been a highway for travel across Nebraska pretty much for time and per perpetuity. Um, the trails ran there, I-80 runs there today, uh, we know from historic records, um, Pawnee and Odo and some other groups used it as a route to hunt bison. And we talked about, you know, trade to the West Coast. Um, they're probably following the Platte River to get out to the Rocky Mountains and go over the Rocky Mountains. And they're probably following it to the Missouri and then heading south. So it's just, um, the technology changes, but people are people, even 10,000 years ago. We have the same idea that it's nice to walk near the river and, and where it's flat and I can drink, you know, things like that stay the same. And that, that personally, that interests me is, is kind of the things across time that don't change so much, um, which is really interesting too. Um, something else that we get questions about, um, which is pretty interesting to me. Um, people ask about, you know, kind of like reservation age uh, Native American sites. Again, people will ask, well, what do we, what, why did archaeologists get involved with that? You know, because that, that, you know, we're talking 1850s and later. Um, there's Indian agent records, there's government records, there's military records, and, you know, there's tribal records, um, which is all true, but you, we got to think about how 
you know, just the upheaval of those native cultures when they were um, taken and, try and forced into trying to be farmers. Um, what I would like to know more about is, is um, sort of what cultural material traditions they, that persisted through that transition. You know, I know from personal experience and, and research that, you know, one of the first things to change is the Native American ceramics go away almost immediately or more quickly because um, metal kettles are so much lighter and durable and more efficient and once the native groups got their hand on them they, they didn't really feel the need to make ceramics as much but you know stone tools and bone tools lasted a lot longer because uh, you know not a lot of government agents are making high you know manufacturing specific metal hide scrapers for working buffalo roads and stuff at least not right away so just just what you know what what changes and what stays the same and why why these things happen you know that's something that we can only ask of you know that kind of narrow time frame when people were the native groups were still trying to live their native life way but they were under a lot of pressure and a lot of contact from white people or euro americans to to change and assimilate and you know what's interesting is the, the things they held on to longer and why and why they did that and again you know archaeology is something that helps us get to that because um, especially if these things held um, religious significance you know a lot of these reservations had missions and you know a savvy native person is not going to advertise that they're still practicing their their native religion when you know the Baptist missionary is standing over him with his Bible and his you know his gun telling them you need to come to church and you need to be more like me but archaeologically we can find you know ceremonial sites or um, altars in in earth lodges we know um, a lot of earth lodges had a special altar site in in the back of, opposite the entrance way um, for religious ceremonies or hanging medicine bundles or having bison skulls set out so you know that's something we're not going to know without archaeology so that's it that's interesting mr tom Nolan, can you give us an idea of the magnitude or the number of recorded sites set? Tom wants to know about uh, recorded sites in Nebraska. That's a good question. Um, last I checked, there's about 11,000 recorded archaeological sites in Nebraska. Um, and that ranges all the way from, you know, single prehistoric artifacts somebody found somewhere that we document and write down to uh, you know, large native villages of hundreds and hundreds of earth, you know, probably not hundreds of earth lodges, dozens of earth lodges and fortifications and Euro abandoned Euro-American farmsteads, um, abandoned town sites, uh, just any, all, all hosts of things. I mean, obviously, uh, there's more things that are newer in time just because there was more people and preservation is better. Um, the earliest sites in Nebraska, we talk about Paleo-Indian culture, and we can zip back to come on thing uh, to some pictures of paleo indian stuff and these are big game hunters from 10 12,000 years ago uh, we don't know a whole lot about these folks because we don't find usually intact campsites or um, intact burials we find clovis points or Folsom points or alberta points you know the stone artifact that preserves is what gets preserved. Um, the Hudson Mang site out in the, in western Nebraska is one uh, is one exception. Uh, this is a bison kill event, and there's some debate. Um, you know, there's hundreds of dead bison in this one spot, and people will argue back and forth whether um, the native groups, whoever was out there, herded these animals into this. Probably was a swamp where they got stuck and died or if um, there's some thought that they were all in the swamp drinking and it got struck by lightning and they just died and then people came and uh, finished off anyone that wasn't quite dead and then used the, you know, took advantage of this resource. But we do know that there are these big Alberta points um, found in association with this bone bed. So we know native people were there utilizing this resource, whether or not they actively caused the death of all these bison is a little bit up for grabs. But that's one case where there is a big, you know, Paleo-Indian site. But most of the time, um, we just have single points that somebody found 
usually in like a secondary deposit in a riverbank or on a gravel bar. Um, so we just don't have as many of them, but you know, uh, 1800s farmsteads, you know, there's lots of those around and a lot of them, get, some of them get recorded and some don't. So there's more of those and obviously uh, Native American sites that are less old, there's more of that because there were more of them and preservation is better um, when stuff is in the ground for less time too. What's the difference between archaeology and paleontology? The gentleman wants to know the difference between archaeology and paleontology. That's a good question when we're talking about a big pile of bones. Um, archaeologists deal with humans and things humans modified or things humans did. Um, if humans weren't involved, if, it just, if this was just a natural kill site and there's no sign of human activity, then it would be a paleont paleontological site because a paleontologist deals with animals from the past. And an archaeologist also deals with animals from the past, but only in reference to how uh, humans interacted with them and used them. <clears throat> um, it's a good question. The gentleman, when the camera says we got about five minutes left, uh, if anybody has any any other questions here. Um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, from our online questioner, um, wanted to know how can you learn more about what's been found in Nebraska? And that's a good point. Um, archaeologists, you know, a lot of times we're pretty secretive sometimes about what we do because we're worried about sites being impacted by uh, looters or, you know, just we're afraid if word gets out, people will mess with stuff. But um, the Historical Society has uh, published archaeological material in its magazine, Nebraska History. Tom talked about if you're a member, you get Nebraska History. A lot of those are available. The back issues are available online for free as PDFs on uh, the ne our website, nebraskahistory.org. So you can go back and look at And there's some real interesting ones from um, the 30s and 40s about uh, these massive excavations that took place, um, especially in the 40s and uh, during the Depression when uh, Works Progress Administration, that was one thing they did is the Historical Society had access to all this labor and they excavated a lot of big sites and they, they turned up a lot of material. And then after the war in the 50s, there's a lot of stuff that was done before they built all the reservoirs in western Nebraska and um, the society published information on that. And there's also um, publications available in a, at the landmark store at the Capitol or again online about um, archaeology that's been done in Nebraska. Or you can come talk to us at our new location on South 16th Street and we have some um, publications and anthropology back issues that we'd be happy to sell or give away about different things. Um, so there is ways to learn about what's been done in Nebraska and especially what the Historical Society has been doing. Um, Historical Society has been around for over 100 years and um, they've been doing archaeology for that long as well. So a lot of stuff, a lot of information is out there for people. Well, I think we'll, we'll call it a day. Thanks everyone for coming and braving the weather and hopefully we'll see you next, next month.